Yes, in the back? Yes, excellent. Um, I'm gonna start with a question. And the question is, how many of you are alarmed, concerned, or very concerned about the effects of climate change on coffee? Raise your hands. So pretty much the majority. Well, I'm not gonna speak about effects of climate change on coffee. Today I'm gonna to speak about the effects of climate change on two other specialty crops, tea and maple syrup, which I have been studying for over a decade. And this really is to serve as a lens in thinking about how we can harness the power of science in analyzing and measuring how we can measure climate change effects on uh, coffee. Uh, my research on climate change effects on tea is very much driven by farmer observations and farmer concerns. And I'm gonna tell you about that very specific cup of tea that drove my research to thinking about the effects of climate change on tea quality. This was over one decade ago when I was carrying out research in Yunnan province of southwestern China. Who in this room has been to Yunnan province? There's an expanding coffee market over there. And uh, as an ethnobotanist, I'm extremely interested in human interactions with the environment. And this interest has driven me into some remote areas around the world where indigenous agricultural practices are still intact, such as this Aka village over here, um, which uh, grows tea in these wonderful agroforests for hundreds of years. Uh, tea in these mountains of southwestern China grows in indigenous agroforest, and it also grows in wild tea populations. This is the motherland of the tea plant and the center of origin and diversity. And specifically, I was studying the sustainability of tea production systems along a continuum of agricultural intensification. I was comparing these wild tea populations to these indigenous agroforests all the way to these monoculture systems. And looking at sustainability among four dimensions, ecological, economic, social, cultural, and human health. And the indigenous agroforest uh, ran quite well in looking at sustainability. They have rich biological diversity at the landscape, genetic, and plant species level. So as an ethnobotanist or botanist, uh, I would see these different tea land races that grow in one hectare agroforest as Camellia sinensis variety samica. But the farmers that are managing these systems actually have different names for each of these different land races and are managing these systems and this genetic diversity for different flavor profiles, for different resistance to different climate variables, uh, really not putting all of their eggs in one basket, uh, even within a small agroforest. And tea in these systems can grow quite large. Imagine one of these tea leaves unfurling in your teacup. And now I'm gonna tell you about that cup of tea that drove my research on climate change effects on tea quality. This was during one of my very first field seasons in Yunnan. And after a long day of carrying out ecological transects in the indigenous agroforest, I was having tea uh, in this farmer's household. And I was sort of returning every day uh, to drink tea after my field work. And one day, Aying says, it has changed. The taste has changed. And I was really intrigued by what she was speaking about. And she said, yes, it's changed since just a few days ago. And what I was speaking about was the onset of the East Asian monsoon. And so that year in Yunnan, it had been an extraordinarily dry year. Yunnan's seen a drought for the past few years in the spring season. And then at the same time, it's actually been seeing more intense and extreme monsoon seasons. And the monsoon seasons were actually getting earlier. And so this was really uh, shifting farmers' labor schedules, as well as the quality of tea, and most importantly, the livelihoods that farmers are procuring from this tea. And so this made me think about what is happening in terms of climate change with this increased variability in terms of droughts and uh, monsoons and other environmental factors linked to climate change. <laughs> 
Um, this graph over here shows how the shifts of the monsoon very much matter to farmers. This is prices that farmers receive in this village for one kilo of tea. So here, let's say in 2012, the dry season tea, which was um, undergoing a drought, received almost $400 per kilo. That's what the farmers were receiving per kilo. And then as soon as the monsoons hit, they evaluate the tea, and then they determine a new market price, uh, which is almost 50% less, so less than $150. And so this really impacts uh, farmers when the monsoon seasons are coming earlier or are getting longer with climate change. And as I continue to work in the mountains of uh, southwestern China, uh, dozens of farmers began to express these concerns, how they were observing all of these different climate factors that were impacting tea yields, tea quality, um, and ultimately their livelihoods. And this led me to develop or initiate a collaborative research project with scientists from all different fields thinking about how we can look at tea as an indicator species for climate change. And plants such as tea and coffee make really suitable indicators for assessing climate change, unlike animals and humans that can run away from a lot of abiotic and biotic stressors plants are rooted in place. And so when they're attacked by predators or there's extreme sunlight or temperatures are shifting, they can't simply move away. They actually have evolved this extraordinary uh, pathway of secondary metabolites to defend themselves. And um, so all of these different factors are impacting plants and they're defending themselves with these compounds. These compounds we as humans can perceive as flavor compounds or as therapeutic compounds. So in tea, for example, the sort of star antioxidant compounds are actually plant defense compounds that the plants are producing to defend themselves against environmental stress. And so these levels are varying with environmental factors and then depending on uh, agricultural management practices and climate change, these levels are changing and then we actually as humans can perceive shifts in the concentrations, which ultimately determines prices. Are you ready for some really juicy data? Okay, so I became really obsessed with documenting that cup of tea when Aying says that the flavor shifted. I wanted to know physiologically what was happening in tea plants, what was happening phytochemically. And so I decided just to do a seasonal study to see what was actually happening in terms of the key antioxidant and other flavor compounds, and working with my collaborators using different approaches to get to this question. Um, and I'm gonna just point out one graph over here first, if I can get to it. Oh, okay, this graph over here. So we're gonna look at this graph over here. Um, on the axis over here, we're looking at changes in season from an extreme drought. Farmers really love the tea during that drought season. Um, if it had become too much of a drought, they would have lost their crop, but the drought levels that were happening that year were perfect for the aromatic compounds of tea, so they were really benefiting from this wonderful tasting tea. And then when the monsoons, this is a monsoon onset, and this is the monsoon onset. And here we have the concentrations of EGCG, that's that star antioxidant compound in tea. It's a phenolic compound, and it's also um, associated with different flavor profiles of tea. And we're seeing that a compound is decreasing more than 50% just within a two-week period. And it's not just that compound, it's other key compounds, phenolic compounds, and also caffeine that are changing uh, just within this two-week period. And then I began to think about, well, can we correlate this with um, climate change? Can we actually sample tea during different seasons um, in different agroclimatic zones where tea is grown and then link that with temperature and precipitation and CO2 levels and then begin to model how the flavor profiles of tea are changing with climate change and then do some forecasting of what's gonna happen in the future.
And then my collaborators at Tufts University um, also measure the same T samples, and they found, uh, they quantified hundreds, over 100 um, volatile aromatic compounds, and they also found that there's changes in the concentrations of those volatile aromatics, not just um, in the concentrations, but actually in the presence. And so some of the spring T samples um, actually have compounds that are considered very uh, favorable, such as having floral or honey-like flavors, and some of the monsoon um, teas have compounds that are considered undesirable, such as having more vegetal flavors that are not looked as, as favorably. And then what does this look like in the context of climate change? And so in the specific area of southwestern China, we see that the spring season is actually predicted to uh, decrease and become more dry. So four to six percent decrease in precipitation. Um, is this good? Is this positive? Raise your hand if you think this is positive for flavor of tea based on the graphs I just showed. So based on this, if it's um, based on this graph where we're seeing that the spring drought has the highest level of antioxidants and then the monsoon season has the lowest, and then I'm gonna skip. So when we're seeing that the spring is gonna get drier, do you think farmers are gonna be sort of excited looking at this momentarily? So it could be positive, right? And then raise your hand if you think that in the monsoon season with a six to eight percent increase in precipitation, if that could be detrimental. Raise your hand, raise your hand high so we can, so we're all on the same page. Excellent. So, uh, so at some part of the year, there's actually some positive things that are happening uh, with these shifts in climate. And then in other parts of the year, there's actually detrimental things that are happening. Um, however, we, if the plant goes over its threshold in terms of water, um, all plants have different thresholds in terms of water stress. And if it actually goes above its threshold, if that four to six percent decrease in precipitation is too much, then the crop, there's going to be crop failure and there's going to be no crop at all. And so then how do we begin to model this? And this we are doing manipulative experiments in the greenhouse to actually see what does forecasted climate change look on crops? What's the threshold that plants can tolerate, tea plants specifically, um, in terms of these different stressors without being too detrimental even in the spring season? Um, and then what's really exciting is we also have received a new collaborative grant to continue this work, also looking at the effects of CO2 on tea quality. And what's really interesting is uh, we are replicating this work in multiple sites in three different agroclimatic zones in China. And while precipitation is sort of the driving force of impacting tea quality in um, southwestern Yunnan province or southwestern China, temperature is actually the key driving force that's uh, making tea vulnerable in the eastern part of China. And so we're really seeing that the specific climate threat really varies depending on geography. It's not really this one size fits all picture. It's very subtle and it really depends uh, where you are. And um, the more I continue to um, work on this research and speak to different producers, we are recognizing that this trend is not just specific to tea. Uh, since 2012, I've also been examining the effects of climate change on maple syrup quality. And it started in a dialogue where I was telling some producers in Vermont, some maple syrup producers in Vermont, about my research on climate change effects on tea quality. Um, and this maple syrup producer runs to her fridge and pulls out these three different samples of maple syrup and says, we're experiencing the same exact thing with maple syrup. During my lifetime, I've noticed that uh, the maple sap season starts earlier. It also sometimes ends earlier. And most importantly, the high grade maple syrup is decreasing in amount and the more lower grade maple syrup is increasing in amount uh, due to weather variability. Um, and my collaborative, our collaborative research team, uh, we've worked with uh, hundreds of producers to sort of document this and the majority of producers are also uh, expressing that the harvest season for maple syrup is indeed starting earlier and very interestingly the budding of the maple 
trees is also starting earlier. And as soon as the maple trees begin to bud, there's off flavors that happen uh, within the tree, which is contributing to some off flavors. So very interesting in thinking about quality. And then um, we have been sampling across the agroclimatic zone off maple trees uh, for the past four years from the southern range in Virginia all the way to Quebec, and then correlating what's happening with key compounds, including sugar compounds and phenolic antioxidants during that period. And we're seeing this significant uh, correlation as temperatures e decrease, there's a significant decrease in the antioxidant compounds in maple syrup. And then what does this mean in the future? So this data is really exciting to me. Uh, this is looking at the shift and changes of uh, sugar content and sugar yield for maple syrup across its different zone. So if you're looking at that map of sort of the eastern part of North America, all those are the different sites where we have been collecting um, maple sap since 2013. And we can see uh, that based on our data, that the sugar content of maple is expected to decrease um, in the next 50 years. Um, and in most of our sites, the yields are also expected to decrease. However, in the northern range of maple, uh, yields are expected to increase. And what's also really exciting about this, in the next phase of this project, we are working with um, high school students and farmers to do some citizen science where they can actually, producers and students can actually collect the data uh, so we can have a larger network of collecting uh, where these changes are happening. And I think this would be really exciting to also see in tea as well as in coffee. So from the research I've been working on with tea and maple syrup, it's really obvious that climate change is indeed happening now. It's influencing specialty crops now, the quality and farmer livelihoods, and that consumers are able to perceive these differences. I've been working with six different sensory panels, uh, both in the United States as well as in China, uh, to discern these differences. And most importantly, um, we know that climate change is happening, but how can we mitigate this risk? Are there actually innovations that are happening? And so the first innovation that I have been looking at is the indigenous tea agroforest, a practice that's been uh, in play for hundreds of years. And this is looking at the total catechin content. This is an index of measuring uh, 12 different secondary catechin compounds in tea. So this is from the same exact mountain using the same land race of tea um, in, the same, in the same region and uh, quantifying the amount of total catechins. And the tea agroforest had more than two times the amount of total catechins compared to the monoculture plantations, which, um, and the tea agroforest also su supports sustainability because there's no agrochemical input in these systems. They're relying on the forest structure to provide uh, pollination services, fertility, um, and protection against, against pests and pathogens. And what's really interesting is looking at the changes from that monsoon onset. And so when the monsoons come, what's really interesting is that the quality in both the indigenous agroforest and the monoculture plantation do decrease with the, with the onset of the East Asian monsoon. However, that difference is not as noticeable in the um, indigenous agroforests. And so really thinking about sustainability practices and helping mitigate against climate risk. Um, and so I'm going to leave you with three questions today. Can you discern between climate sensitive tea and maple samples? Tomorrow you'll have the opportunity. We're going to set up a sensory booth in the sensory experiences outside. Uh, there will be two different samples of spring and monsoon tea. So you can see if you can uh, discern the differences and which ones you prefer. Uh, we've actually, through such sensory experiences, found there's new markets uh, for some of the monsoon teas. Um, and so these are actually, this is actually very important data collection for me. And then uh, there's also going to be two samples of maple syrup, uh, one that is sort of the higher grade and the other one that is becoming more prevalent with climate change. Um, how is climate change changing the phytochemicals and flavors of other specialty crops? 
such as coffee? And then what is the ro role of sustainability practices in mitigating a climate risk? Um, thank you so much uh, for your time. I'll be happy to take questions later. Um, and then in terms of funding, I wanted to thank the federal agencies that have supported this research for more than a decade. Thank you. <laughs>